trying to decide how old it is, but it may be 1638 and it may not be Pierce. But the thing, the, the foundations that you see sticking out of the ground are marking original foundations of a house that was built on the same site but later in time. And it's chopped right into the, this, this building. So, um, we are, we have, in this uh, whole you area, had, uh, okay. yeah, it's a moving target here, isn't it? Um, What's the name of this site then? This, well, Sorry. we think the earliest occupant on this area was a man named Captain William Pierce. And in his, his household, according to a, um, a, a census, of 1625, he had four what he called servants, and then there was Negro um, Angela, woman, mm. as one of the servants. Got it. So it's really the first, um, the earliest documented uh, uh, place where we knew that um, a, a servant, and that's all it's called, is you know, all she's called, uh, is documented here, 1625, the earliest place. And so in, in 2019, we're commemorating the representative assembly down in that church that you walk by. And then here, we're commemorating the first arrival of Africans at this site. And we're trying to find out uh, what Pierce's house was like, what his home lot, we call it, was like, you know, where the fences and gardens and uh, wells and all kinds of, of details that would go into this particular piece of property. Uh, and so far, we found what had been excavated in, 19, in between 1934 and 1936. Uh, and then filled back in again. This is done by uh, uh, a, a, a civilian conservation corps program. Uh, and they dug really quick, and, and we've learned a lot about 17th century houses since. Uh, <laughs> and uh, any questions? <laughs> yeah, uh, about 17th century construction, and usually they're houses that are built with just digging holes in the ground and having posts there, you know. And so. Those guys didn't know in the 30s look, to look for these posts, and we have found a series of posts out here that are beginning to look like it may be from an earlier building, and that's where that's where we where we are so far. We had a field school out here. We've been digging for for three months, and all that you see covered is open uh, from that excavation. So, um, uh, and we are looking forward to another season of excavation, and this is. A cooperative effort between the Park Service and the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation. So these bricks down here is is stuff that you've been able to dig up that you know was a part of the home. It's part of an earlier building that predates this one uh, that you see marked above ground. Mm -hmm. You see, if you, it's hard to connect so the dots. They build on top. Uh, and but uh, so far, it doesn't seem like it's as early as uh, as William Pierce which would be 1620, so this is probably 1640. But uh, it could be sitting on yet another earlier site. So archaeology is that way. You get different layers through time, builds up different uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, type uh, architectural fragments. And that's what we're trying to sort out right now. And it's, it's quite a challenging site because there's so many layers and time periods involved. We want to get back to the 1620. Mayor, he had a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm the mayor. I, I <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll wait. Go ahead. Oh. No, no, I'm just kidding. Really. Well, I, I'm, I, I really would open for questions. You guys chime in. If I'm yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that I've heard that really helps people understand what's going on here is that even though this looks like a park, this is what we call urban archaeology. If you do archaeology in a city, it's like this. Stuff's chopped up. It's worked over. Uh, what's left of the earliest buildings may just be traces of traces of traces, and so you kind of have to go all the way back. And by the time you get back to the 1620s, you're really piecing together the tiniest little puzzle pieces. Um, but it's doable because the stuff doesn't go away unless people make it go away. Right. And if you're doing good archaeology, you can argue with yourself with the different viewpoints. Um, it's constantly changing because with what we find here, we're constantly revising and changing our thoughts on things. Brick talks to us um, how how the brick was made, the length of the brick, the width of the brick, if it was high fired, if it's crumbling, if it's overglazed, every everything in the ground and the soil. Um, sometimes it's, it's very, uh, our senior staff that uh, I work for that's not here today says ephemeral a lot. <laughs> it's a very ephemeral and you have to be really careful that you're not uh, destroying clues as you go. So I 
I guess, uh, so I'm not an archaeologist, and we don't do this side of it, right? Like, that's the partnership that we have that we're fortunate to have with Jamestown Rediscovery. But um, they do this work and help us answer a lot of those questions and context. And I think the end goal we're trying to get to is by 2019, what, what can we say about this first woman, right? This, this first African woman that actually has a name and, and who exists in a very real way in this country as the beginning of uh, the very emergence of slavery in this country, right? What was the context of her life day in and day out? Who might she have crossed paths with? What might her work have been? Uh, and, and if you think about it, you're standing, you're walking, you're walking in this, in this country in the origins of slavery. And, and what, what better place to prompt, I think for us, a really uh, important and intense dialogue about where have we been 400 and plus years ago, or almost 400 years ago, and where are we today? And unfortunately, I don't think we're anywhere near where we thought we would be, or where we'd hoped we'd be. Mm -hmm. And and in many ways, I think this is going to be the catalyst for a very powerful, positive conversation and a very painful conversation about where should we be going and can we use Jamestown Island as a place of healing and, and a place of beginning to say, this is not who we want to be, but we've got to first understand where we were in a much better context. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand that. There are still people who will debate whether these people were indentured. You know, in other words, they could have bought their way out versus, yeah, no, that really wasn't an option. <laughs> you know, they weren't going anywhere. And, and here's why. And um, if we need to move, you, let, you guys let me know. But um, that's going to be a really tricky conversation to navigate. And, and there's going to be a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different opposing ideas and a lot of very emotional, I think, controversy and and dialogue around what does that mean and and what does Jamestown mean to everybody we want to be able to start to hook in to um, from Jamestown when people come to visit particularly people of color when you come to visit that you feel that you can walk into this place and say I have a place here I have a story here that that connects to me today right that we're going to connect to um, the historical society Virginia historical society I think it is has a database of all of, um, I don't want to characterize this incorrectly, but they're making a database of all of African Americans who worked and were enslaved in this, this state, of a list of everybody whose names they can get, to hook in and say, who were they, what was their lineage, and try to, try to create sort of a history of who's been here and who was enslaved in this state. And we're going to try to figure out how to connect that, at least back around, to Jamestown Island and be able to talk about this in yep. this powerful way from its very origins to where are we today. And that lightning is yes. turning me a little bit. <laughs> so, so, um, so I guess what I would ask is um, if you could think about the Angela story, we can call it the Angela Project and the Angela home site and the Angela story. Uh, that's all we know about her. But how do we bring, how do we through the media, how do we bring context to her? How do we bring her to life? How do we connect her from 400 years ago to today in a way that people can say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm standing here. I have no clue what it feels like to be enslaved. I have no concept of what that would even mean. But how do we bring that story and what it means, what it meant to her, to life in this space? How do we take what we learn in the archaeology and translate it into uh, a, a powerful story of change and growth and, and integration and a far more positive story than where we have been and we want to see ourselves as the origin of that that positive story going forward I don't know how to do that but we're looking for ways as we move towards 2019 to give some context and understanding to that so um, so in whatever way your articles can prompt thought can prompt engagement um, I think that that opportunity is this is a, this is a place it, it's very powerful for people who can stop and really think to themselves you know uh, am I allowed to walk down in there? Probably yeah, not. Stuff on the rack. Yeah. Okay. She was here. What did she face? What was she thinking? What was her trip like? Or how grateful must she have been to have actually made it across and not died in the battle? But what was there to look forward to? We we got to figure out how to tell that story. I mean, it's powerful for me, and I, I don't know that I see myself as being connected to that in a way that that other people might. And so, how do I how do I 
translate that on behalf of the park service and that provoke that thought for people and really when you think about the media coming here and the stories that you can tell we need your help in connecting people to this place for the purposes of trying to move us forward in a different direction so um you want to stand here and help yourself i do want to stand there i have a question though for you 